homeostasis, which is a big word with a relatively simple meaning. Homeo means the same, and stasis basically means to stay, right, or what, what, what condition you're in. And so this is all about staying the same. Staying the same. Biologically, what that means is that we want everything to sort of maintain a certain balance. So another word that we often hear when we're talking about homeostasis is balance, right? And so you can consider a teeter-totter, and if you put too much weight on one side of the teeter-totter, then the teeter-totter ends up out of balance. If you put too much weight on the other side, and so on. So what has to happen is your body has to try to keep the teeter-totter as close to balanced as possible. It's impossible to stay perfectly balanced, so typically, picture a teeter-totter that is able to sort of swing through a small range, right, as it pivots. And this is what we are trying to achieve. This is a, a small range of variation. A small range of variation. We don't want any wild swings up or down. And so what we need to have in a, in a living system are mechanisms that can keep the teeter-totter within this small range of variation, within this homeostatic range. And this is why, of course, we see things like, you know, people who have to keep their body temperatures within a certain range. If it's too hot or too cold, dangerous things happen. We have to keep the levels of nutrients in our bodies at certain nice levels, vitamins and things. Um, a lot of people don't understand this homeostasis and they misunderstand uh, how the body works and processes these things. So, all right, so uh, a small range of variation. Now, we are going to specifically look at humans uh, eventually, uh, but basically bear in mind that every single cell is undergoing processes, biochemical processes are essentially what's responsible for keeping these these things, these things in a range. So it's biochemical processes ultimately that can are responsible for this, uh, which then result in changes, changes in basically our behavior. Uh, homeostasis is very closely related to our psychology as much as it is our biology, because these changes in behavior are ultimately uh, sort of induced by the biochemical processes that are changing in response to the various levels of things, but we change our behavior. For instance, if we get too hot, we move to a cooler spot in the shade, for instance. If I feel thirsty, I drink water. Those are behaviors, right? But those behaviors are ultimately induced by things that are happening on a biochemical level. All right. So for humans, um, we have several, you learned in grade 11, there are several body systems right? Several body systems. And these body systems, or I guess we could call them organ systems, that might make you remember something from last year. Organ systems. So we have, for instance, our respiratory system, which is working to maintain a constant level of O2, right? That's basically the purpose of our lungs. If our O2 gets too low, our lungs are working harder. They're, they're, um, working faster, I guess, breathing more quickly. If our O2 is getting too high, we, we calm down, we breathe less. So our respiratory system is working to maintain a nice even keel. Our digestive system is working to maintain um, the proper levels of nutrients that we need. Digestive system, not systems. Most of us have only one digestive system. Unless you're a Klingon, I think the Klingons have they have double systems, so that when they get into a fight, if they get their heart stabbed, they have another one. And uh, of course, Klingons aren't real, so. But anyway, so digestive system working to keep our levels all in check. Um, our circulatory system, which is a transport system, but of course it's involved 
because the circulatory system is what's moving everything around our bodies. Uh, so it's sort of linked to all the other systems. In a sense, you can think of the circulatory system as basically the bus service for all the other s systems that are doing things, right? But there are changes to our circulatory system that happen as a result of our, our desire to be homeostatic. Um, when we get our, our uh, fight or flight pump up mechanism, blood vessels constrict and dilate and our, our heart beats faster and so on. Those are all sort of part of this. Our nervous system. Our nervous system is continuously uh, monitoring our, our overall state. And again, the nervous system is a communicative system that connects all the parts of our bodies and allows them to communicate. But of course, the effects of that are that messages can be sent and different things can happen, changes in our behavior as well. Uh, our endocrine system. The endocrine system is not one we learn a whole lot about in high school, unfortunately. Uh, we will learn about the endocrine system a little bit this time. It's our glands and all the hormones and molecules that are used as chemical messengers in our body. And again, those are in different levels and they're up and down and we have to maintain them. There's our reproductive system, believe it or not, which is constantly trying to uh, produce a homeostatic condition. The hormones associated with our reproductive or organs, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, um, females tend to have a lot more because of the whole reproductive cycle. There's prolactin and there's uh, uh, all, kinds of, all kinds of hormones that control the different aspects of pregnancy. Those are all part of our reproductive system and they're all about balance as well, everything. Um, we could write down just about every system in the body if we wanted to. Our integumentary system, your skin, right? It's maintaining, it plays a role in maintaining, especially like if you think about your body temperature and your sweating process and all of those things. Uh, we'll just write skin here. Um, your uh, skeletal system, your skeletal system. A lot of people don't realize that skeletons in the course of evolution evolved, well, likely evolved first as means of calcium storage, not as bones for, uh, for the attachment of muscles. That, that was sort of a secondary bonus. But the first bones were really just lumps of calcium being stored by creatures that were moving from seawater, which is high in calcium, into fresh water, which is low in calcium. So things that could store calcium had a survival advantage in freshwater conditions. So your skeletal system originally developed as a way to keep in balance your levels of calcium that you need in your body. And calcium is a very important ion for the function of many things, muscles, nerve cells, and so on. So your skeletal system, basically all of our organs and everything that's going on is in some way, shape, or form related to this idea of keeping everything within a nice sort of easy level. We're going to focus on um, the respiratory and digestive system in grade 11 and 10. You hammer that one in high school. Everybody does the digestive system 12 times. Um, we're not going to get too much into that. Uh, we can talk about it a little bit maybe. The circulatory system, again, you do that in grade 9 or 10, 11. Uh, we are going to look at the nervous system in particular, the endocrine system. Um, and, uh, oh, one I don't have on here that's very important, the Ex, uh, excretory system. That's one that we will look at, which deals with the kidneys and how we get rid of what we call our metabolic waste products. But not only that, kidneys do far more than just get rid of waste. They also regulate and control our osmotic balance. They control our water levels, which is incredibly important for living things. So those are the three where we're headed. And I think we're going to start with, uh, with the kidney, because it's sort of uh, it's a little more biological or a little more biochemical. So we'll start with that one and move on. But before we do that, we're going to look at just in general uh, some homeostatic mechanisms. All of these processes, home, homeostatic mechanisms. So what we mean by this are just processes. 
that allow for the control. And, and they all have a sort of a, a general sort of skeletal structure that we can, we can talk about them with. So um, we're going to first talk in general about how most of them work, and then we'll look at how each of the individual examples applies to that. So a homeostatic mechanism follows a sort of a basic outline. And um, it's a form of what we call a negative feedback mechanism. So first of all, let's talk about two kinds of feedback. Homeostatic mechanisms are sometimes called feedback mechanisms. Feedback mechanisms. And there's two kinds of feedback. There's what we call positive feedback. Now, positive feedback means that when something is happening, the results of that happening cause it to happen more. So an example that I can give you, very few biological systems use positive feedback because what that means is if you have something happening and the result is more, it starts to happen more and then more and then more and it gets totally out of control. That's not maintaining homeostasis. That's driving something off the deep end, right? So you may have heard, for instance, the other day we had this problem. Um, if you have a microphone, okay, <laughs> I'm just going to write the word microphone for obvious reasons. If you have a microphone, right? <laughs> then the microphone is picking up sounds and it's attached to a wire and it goes to a, an amplifier and a speaker. Well, the microphone is picking up the tiny vibrations of a voice. The amplifier is making the speaker pump out that sound and that sound is coming out of here much louder than the voice. If the microphone is in front of the speaker, the loud sound will go into the microphone, which will then put it through the amplifier and make it louder. It'll come out of the speaker louder, and then it'll go back to the microphone louder, and it'll just keep getting louder and louder. It'll cycle, and this is what positive feedback is. The result of the speaker is being fed back into the original uh, microphone, and it's causing a constant buildup. And typically what, what happens is it gets going so loud that it exceeds the limits of what the speaker can handle, and we get all these weird squealy noises that come out and, you know, it's really, really awful. That's called feedback. But it's a positive feedback because what's coming out of the speaker is feeding back in and making an increase again. So positive feedback is when the products actually reinforce their own production. Okay? Negative feedback is the opposite. So negative feedback is when the products that are building up because of some process or, or the action, the products or, or the action that's taken has an effect such that it inhibits or stops the initial process. So that the more of this you have, the less of this uh, action you get. So it's an inhibitory kind of thing, negative feedback. It's stopping the action from happening rather than encouraging it. We often use positive and negative feedback when we discipline children. Positive feedback is trying to make them do something, to encourage a behavior more often. So we reward them. We say, if you uh, clean your room, you will get $5. If you don't fight with your sister for a week, daddy will buy you a car or whatever, right? But Negative feedback is when we take an action that tries to stop or inhibit the action of our kids. If you don't stop fighting with your sister, I will take away your Xbox. Right? That's a negative feedback idea. So the two positive and negative feedbacks, one is an inhibitory type of response, and the other is a um, sort of um, the opposite of that, which would be sort of an encouragement, right? <laughs> Making it greater. All right, so typically we can sort of use a sort of a flow chart. There has to be something that sets things off. That's called the stimulus. So the stimulus is the original conditions that begin the entire homeostatic mechanism. 
all right? So the, stim the stimulus is, is usually some sort of change in your environment or, or change in your internal environment, like a cell's internal environment. Um, the next thing, of course, is that the body has to have some way of detecting that stimulus. So there has to be a sensor of some kind. We have to know that something has changed. And, of course, we have senses, right? Our, our senses are what does this, but we have to think beyond just the, the standard old five senses. Your body has many ways of sensing or detecting changes in its environment. They're not just, you know, sight, sound, touch, and taste, and all that. There's, there's lots of different options. And often, it, um, it can be a biochemical type of change that, that is sensed in a different way, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Then... There has to be some way to take this sensory information and process it, right? That's called the integrator. In a sense, that's our brain. The integrator, the brain has to decide, make the decision, I guess you could say, as to what's going to happen next. So right now we could imagine getting cold. The stimulus is the temperature is dropping in the room. The sensor, of course, your skin is picking that up, and you're feeling the cool. And your body temperature may be starting to drop because of it. And so you have waves. Now, your skin can feel that, but your body temperature drop can also be sensed by parts of your brain, um, the hypothalamus, I think, and some other things, um, that can you know, figure this out. Then they have to sort of let the brain know, because the brain then has to sort of coordinate the action. And what the brain will do is it will, I'm just going to go like this because I'm running out of room. The brain will then go to what's called the effector. The word effect can be a verb. To effect something, I wrote effort, sorry, effector. The word effect, to effect something means to make it happen. I can effect a change. So the effector uh, is basically something uh, typically in our bodies, it could be like a muscle or a gland or something that's going to be told to do something about it. All right? Maybe the brain will decide to send messages to parts of your muscles that say move to a warmer spot. Or maybe it'll send a glandular message to change the rate of metabolism in your body so that more heat will be generated or, or something like that. And then, of course, we get the response, which is the temperature in your body returning to somewhere within that nice homeostatic range. Okay? Now, here's what's important. The response that happens has to, has to somehow stop the process. So, for instance, in our question about body heat, because the response is your body getting cooler, whatever you've done here, then the cooling of your body means that you've removed the stimulus of being warm, and so it shuts this off. Because if it didn't, your body would keep doing that, and you'd just get colder and colder and colder. So there has to be a, a mechanism. Uh, what by negative feedback, what we mean is, that I'm going to put inhibits here, this final end response somehow changes the original conditions so that everything doesn't have to keep on going. And that's kind of like the, the sort of overall sort of um, way we can think about these, these mechanisms. And, of course, the stimulus can be anything. The sensor could be anything. The integrator, uh, usually in humans, it would be the brain. But it doesn't have to be the brain. It, it could be a reflex uh, ganglion. It, there's just other things it could be, but typically it's the brain. The effector could be muscular. It's uh, something that's going to happen. It could be a gland that squirts out a hormone, causes a change. And then the response could be, you know, all kinds of things, too. So this is a very general sort of outlook, okay? Uh, in fact, they have um, a picture in your textbook. I don't think we necessarily need to... Well, let's, let's look at it. Why not? Maybe we will just draw a chart form of it. So what they're using is this, this idea of being too hot. Let me get some more. Are you okay there if I go? All right. So what they're saying is, is that um, there is going to be some kind of body, body uh, change in your body temperature, your environment. The stimulus will be 
the environment is either cooling or getting warmer. And what they've done here is they've shown you two possible sort of paths where, where something could happen. So they start in the middle and they say, this is your body temperature. This is where your body wants to be. And that will fluctuate within a small range. But if it gets to be too hot, right? So what they've done, I'll use red for hot. If your body temperature rises, then instantly the sensor will be thermoreceptors that signal an increase in temperature. So thermoreceptors, those are special cells that in the presence of heat emit a nerve impulse that's sent to the brain that says things are warming up, right? So then those go to the brain, which is the integrator, right? So the thermal receptor is like the sensor. After I write these in, I'll, I'll use a different color. This is the sensor. And this is the integrator, the brain. And the brain decides then uh, what it's going to do. And so the brain will have a couple of things that it do. It'll, it will, in this book, it says that it will cause uh, dilation of blood vessels. I'm going to get a, a finer point here. Dilation, that's better, of blood vessels. And it will increase uh, sweating. It will cause pores in the skin to sweat, right? Both of which have the, have the effect of distributing heat around the body. The, the dilated blood vessels means that your, the, the blood vessels near your surface of your skin will become more filled with blood as the blood vessels relax. This is why you get a flush when you're hot. You get red. Because your skin is filling with, uh, with more blood near the surface. Typically, when you're cold, that blood is held in tighter and the blood vessels constrict. But here, they would dilate. And when the blood is flowing through those surfaces, your skin becomes like a radiator. It allows the heat to escape your body faster. And of course, the sweating makes use of the fact that evaporating water draws heat from its environment. And so if there's water on your body, in order for it to evaporate, it will draw heat from your skin and cool you down. So both of these things result in a temperature change in your body, the temperature drops. But the dropping temperature, right, the dropping temperature brings you back to your homeostatic range. And if, if you're back within that range, the thermal receptors are now not too concerned. So this is a negative feedback in that the final result of dropping temperature shuts everything off at the thermal receptor level. Now that you're cool again, the rest of this doesn't have to happen. Because if not for that, you would just get cooler and cooler and cooler. How would you tell your brain to stop dilating blood vessels, right? And then they have the other one, which is what happens when you get cold. Oh, uh, integrator. So over here, where we have the dilation of the blood vessels and things, this is the effector, right? From our model before, the effector, the integrator, the sensor. And then the temperature dropping is essentially the result of what's going on, right? It's the, the um, overall end product, and then it results in a regular temperature. If we go this way, then what we have in terms of cooling... Oh, sorry, they went the other way, so I'll go the other way too. If our temperature gets colder, it went this way. Again, thermal receptors... Thermal receptors in the skin sense the cold. Uh, we go to the integrator, the brain again. Right? The brain then does something different this time. What it will do if you're cold is it will uh, constrict blood vessels in the skin. And blood vessels. This causes the blood to be sort of pushed more deeply into the body where it can stay warmer. In this case, we don't want heat escaping through the skin. We want to save it to stay warm. The other thing it will do is it will cause uh, shivering, which is rapid muscle contractions. You start shivering and shaking, and that produces heat because the muscles are actively working. 
And of course, that then makes the temperature go up. Blood constrict blood vessels, shivering in the brain. And again, we can see that we can write in here. I'll do it in the, in the red now. This thermal receptors, that's the sensor. That's what's telling us that something's out of whack. The brain is the integrator. Right? And then we have the shivering and the constricting blood vessels, which is the effector. It's the muscles doing their thing, or the, uh, the responses of that. And then we have the, the result here, of the temperature going up. And again, this is a negative feedback system, because once the temperature goes up, it, it interferes with, well, it doesn't interfere, but it, it, it causes the thermal receptors to stop telling the brain you're cold, because you're warm again. So it's a negative feedback loop. All right. Well, it does the opposite of what's causing it. Yeah. So if hot is causing you to be hot, the feedback mechanism makes you cold, reduces heat, not build up heat. And again, a positive feedback mechanism would be one that when you're hot, it would make you get hotter. That's not very useful for homeostasis. There are positive feedback mechanisms in biology, but they're not related to homeostasis because they're not bringing you back to normal, right? That's the key. All right. I'm going to pause for a second. All right. So since we're in the process of talking about body heat, we can, we can learn some terms. Some terms that we use to describe different ways and different mechanisms. So... Um, you've heard of some of these terms before. The first term I'm going to write is called a homeotherm. So a homeotherm is an organism that uh, keeps its body temperature relatively stable regardless of the environment. So maintains a relatively stable, it'll fluctuate a little bit because that's what homeostasis is, but not very much, a relatively stable uh, body temperature. So it will exist in a very small range, right? regardless of how hot or cold it is in the environment. Humans, of course, do this, right? Humans do not like our body temperature moving all that much. A body temperature shift of even a degree or two is enough to just set off all those kinds of things. The opposite of that is something that doesn't do this, so it's called a poikilotherm. So, poikilotherm. A poikilotherm uh, allows its body temperature to shift and change. So in this case, the, the body temperature varies with the environment. Yeah. Like a frog, an amphibian, snakes and reptiles tend to do this. So the, what you'll see them doing in the early morning is out sunning themselves. They're trying to absorb heat from the environment to warm back up again. At night, they tend to get quite cool. Uh, they, they can uh, basically exist with their body temperature going through a very high range of high to low that we cannot. Frogs, for instance, can allow, can allow themselves to freeze in the mud on, over the winter. They literally bury themselves in the mud, and they actually freeze because the frost goes down and freezes them. But they also have a means of thawing out they secrete a, a special kind of an antifreeze, I guess you could say, in their blood that goes through all of their cells. The problem with freezing, freezing won't kill you, it's the thawing out because the ice crystals that form when you're frozen are sharp and pointy, and they poke holes in your cells. So if you can find a way to freeze without having ice crystals form, which the frog does, it uses an antifreeze that it, it makes in its, in its body, and then secretes right around the fall so that when it does freeze it will not form ice crystals so that it can thaw and there's no damage to the cells 
A great question was asked. Do the cells still age while frozen? Um, I can't answer that yes or no, but I can give you insight. I can tell you that uh, freezing something or shutting something down has the effect, as you know, the rates of chemical reactions slow down when things are cold. Life is essentially chemical reactions. And so what you could say is that when something is frozen, it would be in a suspended state. So all of the biological processes would slow down, which would indicate that life is sort of in a, a hiatus, right? And in fact, we know that animals sort of do this. The frog actually freezes. Other animals just go into a slowdown. We'll talk about that later, hibernations and estivations and things like that, um, that do actually stop body processes. So if aging is defined to be the continuous cycle of body processes, then I guess you could argue that freezing something would sort of stop or at least very much slow down aging. And of course, we talk about freezing people as a means of preserving them so that we can, down the road, revive them if we can cure their diseases, right? Now, in that case, they're usually already dead. I don't think anyone's volunteered to be frozen alive and then be rethawed. Uh, so the hope is that whatever killed you is something we can cure, and in that frozen state, you could stay that way. That remains to be seen. If that actually works, we'll find out. Or somebody down in the future will find out, but not us. So poikilotherm, body temperature varies with the environment. So if it's five degrees outside, then the body temperature of this organism is likely going to be very close to five degrees. Right? So the main thing here is, is that they shift. We used to use the words you know, warm-blooded and cold-blooded to describe these animals. Those terms are, are not used officially because they're just too confusing and they're, they're also misleading. So homeotherm and poikilotherm. Now, to make matters confusing, there are two other words we use that are related to these, but are more related to not the temperature range your body tolerates, but how you maintain your temperature. So there's such a thing as an ectotherm and an endotherm. An ectotherm is an animal that absorbs heat from its environment. From its environment. And an endotherm is an organism that generates heat inside of it through biochemical processes, right? The burning of glucose, for instance, generates heat biochemically. Biochemically. Inside of it. So endo, meaning from within. Ecto, from without. Okay? Now, what's interesting is you can have, you can have a mammal, well, a homeotherm, if you're a homeotherm, you can do it two ways. You can maintain your relatively constant body temperature by generating your own heat biochemically or by absorbing that heat from the environment. But it's much harder to do that, isn't it, from the environment. So it's probably safe to say that most homeotherms are also endotherms, but it's not necessarily true. And then we have poikilotherms who allow their body to shift. And so ectothermic mechanisms tend to, because you're relying on the environment, you need, you need sunshine, if it's not sunny, whatever, uh, they tend to be a little more uh, shifty in their temperatures, so poikilotherms. But the two words are not necessarily synonyms. You can't say ectotherm and poikilotherm are the same thing. You could have a homeothermic organism that maintains a relatively even temperature and does it by sucking energy from the environment. It's just rare. And we'll stop there.